Open your Bibles up to Revelation chapter 2. We are going to knock out Ephesus today. Ephesians chapter 2. Not Ephesians. Revelation chapter 2. Wow, that was one of the books. So we come to the part of the revelation given to Jesus and then to John and then via extension to us. And um, we've come to the part that the epistles are, are being written. Jesus is speaking to John. He wants John to write these things down to the seven churches. Um, these churches made up a, a circular pattern in Asia Minor, it was a trade route, and all of these churches were at specific places on the trade route. Now, I talked a little bit last week about the, what these churches represent. I've heard people give good arguments for the different things that they represent. I don't want to go into that. And the reason I don't want to go into that is because that, predic that, that understanding is predicated on your understanding of church history, okay? Now, while I don't want to discourage you from studying church history, I don't think you need to know church history to be able to receive what Christ <coughs> is speaking to the churches. Um, I've also heard that each of these churches represents a different epoch of the church history, uh, with Ephesus being the apostolic age and, and going on down, and then Laodicea representing the current church age. I don't think I believe that as much as I used to um, for the simple reason that the church that we see around us today, not just Jesus Community Church, but the church in America uh, is radically, radically different than the church in Asia. And that church is radically different than the church in Africa. And so I, I don't think that we could look at any one of these and say, ah, that represents us today. It might represent the group that we are a part of today, but there are other parts, other groups in the body of Christ that other churches represent. And some of these churches, some of these letters, we're going to see uh, Christ is, is very hard, almost to the point of being harsh with these churches. And some of them, he is, is very encouraging, very uh, exhortative. And, and so what I want to get out of this, what I want for us is I want us to look at the things that Jesus is telling each of these churches, and I want us to hold those up in light of our church and see where we might be failing, where we might be weak, and where we might be strong. So we're going to talk about Ephesus. For those of you that uh, have, have read your Bibles, you know that uh, Ephesus received its own epistle from Paul. Um, a, lot of, a lot of things be, being dealt with. Uh, Ephesians echoes... Uh, or actually Colossians echoes Ephesians. Uh, I, I tend to say that Colossians is like Ephesians light, kind of like Philippians is Galatians light. Um, but, but Ephesus was a principal trading town. It's on the coast uh, of the sea. Um, and uh, they were well known historically for being the center of worship for Diana. And that's actually one of the things that people travel to Ephesus today to see is the, the remnants of that great temple to Diana. Now, in this, the time that this letter is being written, the uh, temple was a major part of the acceptable religion of the state. Okay, and so um, these were the, the gods that we, the, the state endorsed and embraced. Uh, and included in that was the worship of the emperor. Um, and, and so people would travel from all over the empire to go to Ephesus to worship Diana. Okay, So this was what uh, was going on in Ephesus. It was a major trading port, uh, very prosperous. It was a very significant political city in um, Asia Minor. Uh, they, they actually received um, any being born into, into that city were automatically considered Roman citizens. So that was a, a definite benefit 
to living in Ephesus. Very few cities outside of Italy actually received that as a city. You could purchase citizenship. You could do it either via money or actions and be rewarded with citizenship. But Ephesus was one of the few places that you could be born in and automatically be considered a citizen of Rome. So let's, let's get into this letter here real quick. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now we've already talked about what those stars represent. That's just a couple verses up above here. We know what the, the golden lampstands represent. And, and so Jesus is reiterating specifically to the church at Ephesus that this is who he is. Now if you notice in each of these epistles, Jesus identifies himself to these churches differently. And that's something you want to kind of pay attention to. Why is he describing himself this way to this particular body? Because each of these is going to be a little bit different. That's one of the things that I really regret in the church today, uh, the translation of the Bible that we have. Uh, a lot of times the names of God, we don't really see them as being names. We see them as being descriptors. But a name is personally identifiable. Okay, so if I'm in a room and I hear somebody say Glenn, whether or not they're talking to me, it gets my attention because that's who I am, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if uh, I say, you know, Thaddeus, um, and he's all back there stretching, thinking, come on, Dad, get to the exciting stuff. <laughs> um, his, his head turns around. If I say Scooby, okay, see her head popped up. <laughs> and that's my name for her. You're not allowed to use it. Just mine, okay? So, um, so names are very personal because they identify the person, okay? I, I, in, in our society, we don't really have, have a, a good reason for naming somebody a particular name other than we like the name, okay? And um, I, I think sometimes we might have missed out on something. Now, there were cultures where, where children were given a name when they were born, and this name was a temporary name, and they wouldn't be given their, their, their real name until the parents got to see what kind of characteristics, what kind of uh, behavior, attitude, uh, temperament. Uh, and, and then once those things were developing and, and the parents could understand a little bit more about the child, then they received their name. And those names were always significant. And if you read throughout the Old Testament, you see that the names that, that people are given uh, are very specific a lot of times to an event that happened, um, the, especially uh, the names of the patriarchs, uh, because that whole contest was going on between uh, Rachel and Leah, and, and each of the, the patriarchs' names had significance. Um, so one of the things that, that Jesus is doing here is he's giving a description of himself. Okay, and so pay attention to how these things come out. So he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Now let's just deal with this verse here for just a moment, okay? Jesus sees you, okay? He sees and knows everything that's going on in your life. He sees the hardship. He sees the struggle. He sees the victories. He sees the defeats. He sees everything. And he's watching us. We're never going through anything in this life alone. Never. Because God has promised He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. You know, Scripture says that His eye is on the sparrow. Right? Not a sparrow falls to the ground, but that God knows it. And if He pays that much attention to the sparrows, how much more does He pay to us? So, so the first thing that we should get out of this is, is a sense of confidence and comfort that Jesus knows what we're dealing with, okay? And so uh, I see your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. 
but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Second thing that we should look at as a church, we need to be on our guard because the enemy will sow amongst us wolves in sheep's clothing. And they will come in and they will look like uh, one of us. They might speak like one of us. They might know the same scriptures and the same songs. But they are not of us. We need to be on our guard because we are engaged in a battle that does not stop this side of heaven. It doesn't. There may be seasons of respite. There may be seasons where it's easier, but it will not end until we are at our Father's side in heaven. Okay? It's, that's just the nature of the beast, the life that we live. Okay? So, uh, testing those who call themselves apostles. One of the things that I've always found kind of funny is a, a lot of these uh, people in the church will identify themselves with titles. Um, you know, I'm apostle so-and-so, I'm bishop so-and-so, I'm whatever. I've always found that kind of peculiar because I always felt like if, if that's what you are, people should be able to tell that by how you conduct yourself, how you, the, the, the manner in which you conduct yourself. You shouldn't have to give yourself, oh, I'm apostle so-and-so. What does apostle mean? Sent one. Sent one, yeah. Somebody that's sent out, an emissary. Are you an apostle? Yes. Yeah, every, every Christian is because we're all sent out. Not one of us is called to keep this to ourselves. We're, we're called to take it and spread it out. So in that manner, we're, we are all apostles. But here, there's something a little bit different that is, is being meant. Because um, just as a deacon had, uh, literally a deacon means a table waiter, a servant. Okay? And, and so we have these words. Jesus had, had hundreds of disciples, but out of those disciples, he only called 12 apostles. And so the, the, the title apostle became something more significant than one that was just sent out, right? Because scripture is very clear that to these 12, he called to be apostles. But the first time he sent people out, how many did he send? Anybody? When Jesus sent disciples out, how many did he send? Well, there was 70. 70. 70. He sent out 70, and yet not all of those 70 are called apostles. Okay? So the title became something more than just somebody that was sent out. It came to represent somebody that had an intimate relationship with Jesus. Somebody that had insight and understanding into the, the word, first the, the Hebrew Bible, and how that was being fulfilled in that day. Okay, And those people were, were called apostles. Now, the thing about it is, is anybody can call themselves anything. You don't believe me? Look at all the garbage on the news today. You know? I identify as. Wow. Okay? So you can put a title in front of your name at any point. And, and some people will be impressed by that title. Look, I, I told you guys when I became pastor of the church, you don't have to call me Pastor Glenn. Pastor is what I do. It's not who I am. Okay? Glenn is who I am. All right, and, and to, be, to be quite blunt and honest with you, the only difference between you and I is I'm up here. This is the call that God has put on my life. You have a call that is on your life, and it's going to look different than mine. We are all his sheep. Okay? So, um, they have called themselves apostles and are not. Okay. This is something that I see prolifically in the church in America today. We have a lot of people that put themselves forward as being an authority, and yet when they are, are sharing what it is that they are professing God has them share, it does not line up biblically. One of the first things you need to be aware of when somebody is talking with you about scriptures, when they start reinterpreting it, or they start making excuses to deny it, well, that's not for today. Or, 
that's not really what that means. One, when people start saying that to me, that makes me very nervous, okay? Uh, because most of the people that I talk with are not fluent in Hellenistic Greek, okay? And so for them to suddenly give an entirely different meaning to a passage, that should always be a red flag to us. Whoa, whoa. Okay, if this is the case, then why did all of the scholarly men and women that do know Greek, why did they choose that particular interpretation of the word? Okay, so just be on your guard when you hear these things. That should be a red flag to you. When somebody ascribes to themselves importance or significance and they, they put themselves off as someone that is a leader, somebody that you should listen to, okay? Listen, if God has called someone to a position of leadership, it will show up in the way in which they do their business. You shouldn't have to have them tell you, oh yeah, I'm really an apostle or a bishop or, or whatever. Okay? And now, just, just to clarify, I'm not bashing. Uh, there are godly men out there that, that go under the title of bishop. I'm not bashing on these men. I just find it very peculiar that they feel like they need a title. Okay, because the, the whole point is not to look to me. The, the point is I should be holding this great reflecting glass, and as you look to me, you should be seeing in that glass my Heavenly Father. Amen. You should be seeing in that glass Jesus Christ. You should be seeing in that glass not Glenn, but the work that God has done in Glenn. Okay, that's my purpose. So... Um, so being on our guard, we've got to watch for those who call themselves apostles and are not. Now, I was going to do a little example today, um, but actually Chris shared something with me that, that I thought was probably even a little bit more appropriate. They had the baby shower for um, Carol yesterday. Uh, thank you guys for all that showed up and blessed her. I heard Barb did an incredible job with snacks. So we're expecting lots and lots of yummy snacks for the next potluck. Fresh ones, fresh ones, not, not the ones from yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but, but um, she, she shared with me again that the women played. And, and I got to tell you, you guys are sick. <laughs> okay? Because uh, evidently there were there were melted chocolate candies in a diaper, <laughs> and you had to figure out what the candy was. <laughs> now, just because I, there is still an evil bent in my heart, I would have been really tempted to put a poopy in there. <laughs> in one of those. Okay, that's probably why I never get invited to these things. <laughs> Okay, but they had to identify what the candy was. And, and so, um, to be honest with you, if somebody showed me a diaper with a nasty hash mark in it, I ain't smelling it. And I sure as heck am not tasting it. Okay? Because I know what that means. You know, I've had five children. I have five children. I have 12 grandchildren. I've changed all of their diapers. I know what that represents. I don't need to smell it. Oh, no, really, it's not what it is. Then don't do that, you weirdos. But see, look, look, this is what was happening here. These apostles were putting themselves off to be something that they were not. And the church in Ephesus was able to identify them. Now, how were they able to identify them? What do you think gave them that insight? Yeah, we, we, we take these things, we, you know, we are called, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, we are called to judge those who are inside the church, right? We look first at their fruit. What is the, the, the fruit that they are bearing in their lives? But we can't stop there, can we? Because uh, any of you remember uh, Jim Jones? Yeah, before he got all whack in his stuff, he did incredible things. He was an incredible um, um, social... Um, <laughs> Promoter. What? Promoter. Promoter. Well, he, he did a lot of things for the people around him, of, of regardless of, of their, their race, their ethnicity. And, and he did, he had a lot of things that people would look at and go, oh, there's fruit. This 
Jesus must be a man of God. We can't just stop there. Because we've got to look deeper. Because it's somewhere along this line, and, and I don't know where the, this thing crossed over. It may have been there from the beginning, but his teaching got wrong. And he started manipulating Scripture so that people were no longer following Jesus Christ. They were following Jim Jones. Is that the Kool-Aid guy? That's the Kool-Aid guy. <laughs> That's, that he was. Um, and there were many people that called him out. There were men and women that stood up and said, no, this is not of God. And it got to the point where he actually fled to Guyana because the people were making enough of an outcry that the government started taking interest. Hmm, what's going on over here? Okay, We have got to be like the Bereans, that when people come to us and they tell us things, our first reaction should be, go to Scripture. Look it up. Go to someone else that you trust. Somebody that knows the word of God. In the counsel of many is wisdom. Okay? Um, someone very close to me fell because they refused to take the counsel of many. Because they knew what the many were going to say. And they didn't want to hear that. They wanted this lie that this person was feeding me. Because that lie comforted them. That, that lie gave them what they thought they wanted. And so they never went beyond this, this particular sphere because they knew outside of that sphere nobody was going to accept what was going on. Okay? And that's how cults start, right? That's, that's the, the essence of what a cult is. When you stop listening to the godly counsel of brothers and sisters in Christ, you're in a very dangerous place. Okay? So, first thing we should do, we should, we should be looking at their fruit, we should be looking at their speech, we should be holding everything up in light of the word. word. Okay, so uh, as people come in, and, and we've got to be ready because the enemy knows that, that God has a plan for this church, and, and God has things that he wants to develop and, and put through this church, and the enemy wants to come and shipwreck us, and he wants to do that in one of two ways. He wants to come in and cause division. So many churches are rendered ineffective because the people in the church start fighting each other. We are not the enemy of one another. The enemy of us is Satan and, and all of the principalities and powers that are in opposition to the will of Christ. And we've got to make sure that's where our focus is when we're fighting. Look, if we're in a battle together and I take a wound, please don't stab me. What if it's morphine? Mm -hmm. Morphine is okay. <laughs> but push me to the back first, then give me morphine. It's so sad that the Christian army is, is the only army that kills its wounded. Somebody comes to us wounded and, and, and afflicted and, and, you know, we, we condemn them. The church is a sanctuary. It should be a place of healing. Okay? Now, there are times when that is not appropriate. And I think as we come closer and closer to the end times, that will become more and more the case. I think as these people come in as uh, professing to be wounded believers, they're, they're going to be those wolves in sheep's clothing. Okay, And so we have got to be grounded in the Word so that we can identify these false apostles, these false prophets, these false teachers that the enemy is trying to sow in among us. The, the second thing that the enemy does... Uh, is, is he wants to lull us into a sense of complacency, into the, this place of comfort where we don't need to do anything. Life is good. Don't, don't rock the boat. Let me tell you what, there are dead people, there are people dying out there outside the boat. We need to be hauling them in. We can't just be lazy and, you know, kick back in our boat. I'm going to try this, I'll probably fall over. You know? Working on our town. You know? That's, that's not what we're called to. We're called to be reaching into the water and pulling people out of the water, right? Okay, so, so uh, we are, uh, Paul says that we are not aware of the devil's <coughs> schemes, we're not aware of the enemy's schemes. We need to be aware that the enemy is actively working against us. Look, if you are a follower of Christ, if you are a child of God, he is your declared enemy. And he wants to steal from you, he wants to kill you, and he wants to destroy you. That's the only thing that he wants. Okay? So, he has minions that are out working for him. We need to be on our guard against those who would call themselves 
brothers of Christ, sisters of Christ, append titles to their names, but they are not his. Verse 3, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. That verse really spoke to me because I, I just feel like a lot of times we get weary in the body of Christ. We, we don't, we're not very good with patient endurance. We, hardship comes upon us and the first thing we do is tell God, take it away. Okay? We, we are to be patiently enduring for His name's sake. Okay? And, and I found personally in my life when I struggle the most with this is when I get my eyes off of Him. When, when I allow my focus to shift away from Him. Okay? So, um, Bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Verse 4, but. Now, I've told you before that that phrase is one of my favorite phrases in Scripture. In this case, it, it, it's not going from bad to good. It's going from good to bad. And I think when we see this, we should perk up and pay attention. Okay? But I have this against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen. Repent and do the work you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this, I'm going to stop right there for a minute. I don't want to touch on this, okay? So, in uh, the first couple verses, we see... that the church in Ephesus had works. We see that they were busy doing things, which we should be, right? This, they're not condemned for doing stuff. They're actually commended for doing stuff. I see these things. We also see that they have sound doctrine. We know that, that, that they knew what the Word said. Okay? And so they, they were sound doctrinally. They had sound theology. Okay? And that's, you know, one of these days I'm going to come in and I'm going, to, I'm going to have you guys take a test on theology and see how well you know your own theology. Okay? Um, not today. So, um, but what they lacked was at some point their focus shifted off of the, off of the one who saved them to doing the work of the one who saved them. Okay? Their theology was sound, but they lost their first love. And I, I want to warn you, that way lies legalism. That way is dangerous because your behavior becomes more important than your relationship. And if your behavior is more important than your relationship, you've made yourself an idol, a false idol, and you put yourself up on a very shaky foundation because it becomes completely dependent on your ability to do these things. And we all fail. But if your, your foundation is the love that you have for Christ and love that you had when you first came to Him, and there was that, that just instant transformation, and, and all of a sudden, you knew what was wrong in your life was being made right. If we can stay in that place, our theology will still be sound, but we won't become legalistic. We won't become as the Pharisees, who are more concerned about the traditions that they had than they were about loving the people that God had called them to, to lead. They were more concerned about, hey, we got to eat like this, and we got to wash our hands, and we got to stand this far away, and da 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 da, -da and then God will be pleased with us. No. That, that comes as a result of God being pleased with you. And a lot of those things, well, man, why would you take that burden on yourself? So. They had lost their first love. And this is a warning that we should perk up and pay attention to. Have you lost your first love? There are times when I've lost my first love. There are times when life just gets ugly and, and yucky and, and distracting and bothersome. And, and that's when I stumble because my focus is off of the one who sustains me. The one who keeps me. 
My focus gets onto my problems, gets onto my struggles, gets onto whatever it is that I'm dealing with, and all of a sudden I've lost the ability to, to handle the issue. But I never had that ability in the first place. It was my complete and utter dependence on Jesus that got me through it. Okay? So, remembering our first love. Now, notice it says first love. There's not a word in here that's in here on accident. Jesus has got to be our first love. Everything else has to come below that. There shouldn't be anything even on par with that. <coughs> I love my family. I love my kids. I love my grandkids. I love Christy. But when I got my focus on them rather than Jesus, things did not go well. And I want to tell you today, you are not going to lose these things if you put your focus on Jesus. He's going to enable to love them better. Okay? So, something for us to check ourselves. Have we lost our first love? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent. Repent means what? Turn away. Turn away. Turn around. And do the works uh, you did at first. If not, here's the warning. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, can anybody tell me how many people are in the church at Ephesus today? There is no church at Ephesus today, is there? There's no Ephesus. Now, does this mean those people did not go to heaven? I don't believe that. I believe that they lost a position of primacy in the body of Christ. I, I think that, that Jesus wanted to do things with that body, and they were not with me. Okay? But I think this is a warning that we all need to take note of. As a body... Jesus Community Church, I absolutely believe that we have a lamp stand and we have a star and that Jesus takes care of them both. But if we are not willing to do the things that Jesus has called us to do, then we have the potential for this, this body to cease to be Jesus Community Church and the various parts of this body will go to other bodies. Right. Now, um, my prayer is that doesn't happen. I pray that this church grows and, and thrives and prospers, not financially, but, but, but spiritually. Okay? Um, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. And see, there's always that hope right there. God, God presents a concern, a problem, but he always gives us hope that there's a way for that problem to be dealt with. Unless you repent. So if we see them repent, then we see that their, their presence, uh, Christ's presence in the midst of them will remain with them. Uh, yet this you have, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now I've heard a lot of things about uh, what the Nicolaitans were, what they represented, what they believed. Most of those things are speculation. Um, a lot of what people have said are writings from people that uh, are, are older, but we don't have any writings from the people that were here at this time that gives us a clear definition of who the Nicolaitans were. When we read through some of these other epistles, well, we're going to see some of the things that they embraced and believed that were in opposition to Christ. Okay? So when you see that word, take a look at what's going on around it. You'll kind of get an idea of what these people were believing what they were teaching and, and why Jesus hated them, okay? Uh, so, uh, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, notice what he's hating. He hates the works, not the people. He loves the people. He hates the works. God's desire is that everyone would come to salvation. So, he hates the works of the Nicolaitans. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, we see this warning throughout Scripture. We're going to see it uh, in some more of these epistles. He who has an ear. Do you have an ear? 
If you have an ear, hear what the Spirit says. Okay? Listen. Uh, James says that if we don't put into action those things that we have heard, we're like a man that looks, at it, looks intently at himself in a mirror then walks away and forgets what he looks like. Okay? We have to put into action those things that we hear. Uh, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. A couple things that I want to draw out here real quick, and we're going to wrap up. Uh, first thing, um, to the one who conquers. Conquers what? What does he mean? A good, good fight of faith till the end. Yeah. It's just like it's just like Jesus, uh, like Paul says, we run the race to win the race. We we endure till the end of the race. When Paul is writing Timothy, say, he says, "I have run my race. I'm at the finish line. I'm ready to cross over." Uh, our our faith is called all the way up to His taking us home, whether that be through rapture or departing this life. Okay, to the one that endures to the end, to the one who conquers. I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Wow, that is huge. That is huge. Because the only humans that got to see the tree of life were Adam and Eve, but they did not receive permission to eat of it. But to the one that conquers, to the one that endures, to the one that makes it to the end of the race, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life. I don't even know what that's going to be like, but I can't wait to taste it. I don't think it's an apple. Could be an apple. I like apples. Okay. I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, I find this word usage here, paradise, a little bit interesting. Because this is the same word in the Greek that Jesus spoke to um, the thief on the cross. Okay? When, when the, the first thief was mocking him and, and, and then the second one told him, hey, shut up, don't you know, we're up here for a reason, but this man is innocent. And, and uh, Jesus, he speaks to Jesus and says, Master, remember me when you enter your own. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay? Paradise seems to be a distinctly different place than heaven. Okay? I don't know necessarily <clears throat> where it is. Um, I think when Jesus died, I don't think he went to hell. Nobody's in hell at this point. Okay? Hell is being created for Satan and all of his minions. I don't think he went to hell. I don't think he went to the burning side of, of, of Hades or, or uh, Gehenna. I think when, when he went down, I think he went to paradise. And then he took those people that were in paradise in Abraham's bosom with him to heaven. Okay. But, uh, but it's markedly different than heaven, Uranos, which is the place where God dwells. Okay. So why he says here, Jesus is specifying the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. I, I don't really know how to take that because uh, we know that there, God is everywhere at all times. So could the tree of life be in heaven? Could. My question is, if it's in heaven, why didn't he say so? Why did he specify God's paradise? I don't know. One of these days, we'll get to see it ourselves and get the answer. Okay? So, church at Ephesus, a couple things I want to bring out to you for us to remember. One, they endured. They endured with patience. Two, they had sound theology. They were, they were able to identify the false teachers, the false apostles, the false prophets that came among them. Three, that was not enough. That wasn't enough. When, when we stand before God, He's not going to ask us to give a defense of our works. He's just going to check and see if we're covered in the blood. Okay. So three, they that the, the works, the endurance were not enough. They lost what was the most important, their love for Christ.
okay? And if we start there, if we start with our focus on love for Christ, all of these other things, they'll line up. They'll fall into place because God is a God of order, not disorder. So these things will fall into place. Okay? But they also hated the Nicolaitans. I, I don't know who the Nicolaitans are. I, I have some ideas just from some of the other things that we're going to see about them, some of the things they taught. I think they are an entire group of people that are basically um, Balaam's. Okay? And we'll talk about that in, a, in another epistle. Uh, so, and then there's this warning at the end. If you have an ear, listen to what the Spirit says. And if you do endure, if you, you make it all the way to the end, if you endure to the end, I will give you to eat of the tree of life, which, which no human has ever eaten of without it being sinned. 